everybody. Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Thank you for making your choice to be here. And isn't it good to be in God's house in His presence with His people? Yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, come on. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Amen. If you, uh, if you weren't able to be here the last two services, you don't know what God did. And God sent what we needed. And I want you to please uh, make it a matter of prayer for Brother Joe because it is. Uh, we thank God for someone that will allow God to use him. And to uh, be used in that way emotionally is draining. And you get drained enough emotionally, and that's more tiresome than any physical tire you can get. And so let's pray for our brother. And let's open our hearts and hear what the Spirit has to say today. And uh, let's give God a, a big hand of thanks for what he's doing. With that, let's all stand and join Brother Brett to hear this Turn on to page 46, please. Page 46. I'd rather be an old time Christian. In this world, I've tried most everything, and I'm happy now to say.
service is today. We don't want to have a service, and we're not having this as a revival service. During the previous two services, the focus and the purpose was not about raising money to cover the, uh, the needs of the church. This being our regular Sunday morning worship service, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering because uh, to keep God's house uh, uh, operating and continue the ministry here, it takes uh, it takes resources. And God bless you for what you're able to give. We appreciate your giving. I've, I've never, I've told the church this, I've never felt impressed or moved to preach on tithing because you... You guys are so generous, and thank you, and God bless you for that. Uh, Brother Jason, would you ask a blessing over the offering this morning, please? Uh, God bless this offering today, God, and uh, give, uh, help you give what you think they should, God, and uh, thank you for this great service for today, God. As Jesus, let me pray. Amen. 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 Page 235, please. <laughs> Once like a bird in prison, Well, 
Someone else with a prayer request? Yeah, John. Go ahead. We, we uh, remember both of my parents, they have to reschedule my mom's appointment for car surgery. But my dad's is in the middle of the car. We were doing the boat ride from the sure. But Brother Ralph? We ain't been there. Miss Maggie, Brother Ralph's wife. I don't remember her. Remember Miss Cleft? She uh, broke it easy two minutes morning. She's going to Colorado, spent some time with her family out there. And uh, we, will, we want you to be safe as you go, have a good time with them, and you come back whenever you feel that is left. If it's up to me, I'll bring you back in a day or two, but I know you want to be home. Are you going to call and tell her to send me home? Yeah, I'll tell her that she needs to. But it won't work. I'll show you a number at home. Miss Evelyn, yes, that. We have several folks since the pandemic that have not, due to their health and their age and the different issues they're going through, have not been able to get back into church. I hope and pray that some of them. I've watched our services uh, through the YouTube channel. But let's remember Miss Evelyn and many. There's a big hand. Miss Anna Jean? Brother John, let's remember Chris, my grandson, Patty's son. He was at the jail working out yesterday afternoon and it got stout. Mm -hmm. So they're, they had him in the hospital checking his heart and everything to see what's wrong. So I remember him and I remember him. We will. We will, Miss Anna Jean. God bless you. Go ahead, Miss Jean. Yeah, continue to pray for my sister with breast cancer. They're trying to do a uh, drug right now. Yeah, just I asked for for my friend back. He ended up passing away Wednesday morning. They just lost their mom in February. Now they lost their dad. We're praying for that family in their prayers. Yes, Miss Dawn. Just keep praying for my daughter April. She's doing better. So need prayers. We will pray for her. Sure, go ahead, Miss Betty. Sorry, I got another one. This is Sister Jojo. She really needs our prayers. She just came in back there. So prayer messages.
don't draw big crowds these days, so it's not going to be a big number. But it's a good chance for us to uh, really input into uh, the future direction. I, I personally see a role for the association to take in, in terms of our smaller churches combining our efforts to do something for the kids and teens. And maybe that's something we can do. So be prayerful about that. <coughs> if you are interested in, uh, in coming or helping, please let me know afterwards so we can uh, take care of that. So come on. Appreciate you. So thank you. Yes. Oh, someone back here? Thank what you. time, Joe? 6 30. Thank you. So if it's okay with Pastor Joe, y'all are going to get a two-for-one special for me today. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do two songs. Um, the first one I sang uh, last week, so if you remember it, you can sing with me, make me less nervous, that would be great. Um, it is uh, What a Day That Will Be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds.
Exactly what I needed to hear. And I ended up having a pretty good day. So, oh, it was a <laughs> And I, I was really, I was at that very moment, just before the text, I was debating, oh my God, I hate to go in here today, you know, but that text gave me unbelievable power. Just a simple text, just a simple text, but it gave me unbelievable power. And I ended up having a great day. So we as Christians, don't be afraid to let your light shine. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to communicate. Because uh, remember, if you're ashamed, if you're going to be ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of you and him. So you should try. Amen. Huh. You should try your best to let people know that you are a Christian, a Christian, because you never know who's going to recognize the difference in you. One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls, baby. One day there'll be no more children longing for home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the God's land. Amen. One day there'll be no more lives taken to soon. One day there'll be no more need for a hospital room. One day every tear that falls, we wipe out his hand. We will see the promised land. Mm -hmm.
tired and weary bones by the bed. One day when the power of evil is brought to an end, we will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Yeah. 
It seems that every time I need my Lord is always there. And no one else seems to have the time I Jesus, he always cares. And I wonder just what I might Never again want to wait. 
mercies are so sweet And I know exactly what he'll say When I'm down on my knees I always patch things up I'll always give you love When your world is torn apart No matter where you've been I'll wash away your sins And be in your broken heart Yes, I'll always do anything for you, no matter what you do for me. Yes, I'll always do anything for you, no matter what you do for me. serving God is, especially, I believe, like what a revival meeting is. You know, the family of God is the music, the singers, the, the worshipers, we're all together. And there's adjustments we need to make in our lives to be everything that God wants us to be, to produce that sweet smelling Savior, that sweet voice, if you will, to God. And so I, I pray, I pray that our hearts have been touched. If you didn't get a chance to see the services, uh, the messages, most especially this week, look on our YouTube channel, they're there. And let's be very much in prayer for Brother Joe as he comes to share with us again this morning. We appreciate you, Brother Joe, our praying for you, and uh, and just thank God for how he's seen fit and you've allowed him to use you this week. Come on, Brother. Would you believe your Redeemer lives? Would you say amen? Amen. 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 I love the song. That the confidence that we have, that no matter what this world brings against us, we can say with Joe, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I shall see him. Amen. 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 Or not for another. Amen. amen. It is good to be with you, brother. Uh, I'm going to do each of us a favor. I'm going to set my phone here on silent to replace that clock, <laughs> lest we miss lunch. <laughs> uh, so I'm not uh, worried about text messages or waiting for some important phone call. I'm trying to be mindful of your time and mine. Um, and that's, that's a little challenging sometimes when, if you're not careful, find yourself doing something that you're very passionate about, and uh, just sharing God's Word is that for me. And so it's easy for me to just get caught up in the moment, brother. And so I want to be respectful of our time this morning. Let me also say, listen, folks, um, I promise you one thing. I promise you that I have been more blessed by the two services thus far than you have. That the ability, my opportunity to be here has been far more refreshing for me That's than I suspect it has been. And to, I don't say this to embarrass him, but spend time with your, your pastor is always, always an encouragement to my heart. I mean, I love, I love the humility and meekness with which you carry out your ministry. Amen. It's refreshing in this day and time. It's missing amongst humanity and even in the church. And so God, I commend you for it, and I mean that. So my heart has been enriched just by being with you folks. And I want to ask you to do something this morning. I haven't come today, no disrespect intended, but I haven't come today to be encouraged by you. And quite honestly, you haven't come today to be encouraged by me. We've come today to see him. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you to stand because we're going to take a journey into the very throne room of God this morning. I have respect for him. I have respect for him and his word. Isaiah chapter 6 gives you an idea view into what I believe is the very throne room and presence of God. I just want to do, I just can't read this without a statement. Isaiah chapter 6, I want to read this. I think there's 13 verses, if I'm mistaken, in this chapter, somewhere there about 13 verses. I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter because I think it sets the context that we need to hear. 
Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high upon the throne, sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple, and above it the seraphim, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. The house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So let me read that one again, unless you didn't hear it. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their ears, and with their, their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have, uh, have removed men far away, and there, are great, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tent, the remnant. And it shall return, and it shall be eaten and as, a tree, as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Father, we love you today. And we thank you for giving us an invitation to step into the throne room of God this morning through your word. Father, I pray that you would allow us to not take it lightly, but Father, to, to show you the reverence that you're so deserving of. And we just ask that you would help us today to recognize your presence. We know that you're here. You've already promised that in your word. If we're two more gathered in your name, your presence is there. So we, we, we accept that presence. Help us to acknowledge it and experience it today. Help us to see you as you really are, because Father, until we see you, we can't run this to ourselves. So we ask that you meet with us this morning. Honor your name and we'll ask it. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, Isaiah 6, if I'm being quite honest, is probably my all time favorite passage of Scripture to read uh, There's something about it that has always spoken to me on a deep level. When I consider that God is unopening up, he's, he's pulling back the veil, if you will, heaven. And he's inviting Isaiah, common man. You know, oftentimes, if we're not careful, we will see men of old, the patriarchs like Isaiah or Elijah or John the Baptist, and we'll see them almost in, in, in superhuman form. I would remind you that James said of Elijah, he was a man of flesh and blood, just like you and I like passion. I mean, he was, you know, prone to the same things as, as you and I. Yet, as Brother Joe said, it's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that availed much. And Elijah demonstrated that to us on Mount Carmel in his frailty. Amen. God still used it. Right? So when I see Isaiah 6 and God invites us into his presence, you see, that's where I want to spend a few minutes this morning. It's just in his presence. Amen. Amen. Life has a way of taking on a routine. It just does. Now, I'm not suggesting that the last couple of years or so have been routine, if you will. Not with COVID and not with, again, just the, the disarray, if you will, that we see in our culture. I'm not suggesting that's routine. But even in those days, life has a way of taking on a sense of normalcy, right? I mean, you know, there, there are ebbs and flows, there are highs and lows, but by and large, one day will bleed into the next, which will bleed into the next, and suddenly, if you're not careful, you'll look up and those little ones that used to be so little are suddenly not so little anymore, and eons have gone and gone by. Because life can be just mundane. But then there are 
of those occasions when the mundane suddenly ends and life becomes very real. And it can happen on a variety of levels. We see it on a global level sometimes in the forms of wars and pandemics like we have over the last couple of years. We can see it on a national level at times where life will somewhat turn on its ear, if you will. We saw that on September 11th, I think, is, uh, again, just a great example of, of what can happen in a day. When it suddenly goes from normal to abnormal. When the life that you always knew suddenly goes away. It may not take a pandemic. It may come in the form of a phone call from a doctor. It may come in the form of a notice from an employer. It may come in the form of a statement from the bank. It may come in the form of a conversation with a loved one. But in various ways, life has a way of suddenly going from the mundane and the routine to being turned on into you. And my question for us this morning is, what is it that we are to do when life takes that route? I asked the question that the psalmist asked when he said, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And so I want to talk to us for a few minutes this morning on life's defining moments. Because at the end of the day, I'll turn back to, I'm going to give this away, I turned 60 today. Today's my 60th birthday. It's hard for me to believe I still feel 18 in turn. I mean, is that you're still there with me, my friend? Right? You wake up in the morning, you first head in, you have thought in your head, you feel like you're 25 until your feet hit the floor. <laughs> right? I mean, so I, I, I turned 60 today. And if I look back through my life, I'll be honest with you, I can probably summarize my life on one hand of events. I mean, there are a lot of things that have happened throughout the 60 years of my life, don't misunderstand me. But the pinnacles and the valleys can typically be summarized in a, in a relatively small event or a small a, a number of events. And that's the way God's Word was written, by the way, if I can just add. See, we look to, like 1 Kings 18, when Elijah prays his prayer of 63 words and fire falls from heaven, we think, man, where's Elijah today? Right? Or, or, or we see Peter being willing to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And being, I want to say, we're in the water walking through we're Baptist or missionary Baptist today. Right? But I would just draw perspective and remind us that those events that we're seeing in Scripture are those highlights that span thousands of years. That the majority of life is not lived on the mountaintop. That the majority of life is lived in the routine. Amen. Until it's not. And when it's not, the decisions and the actions that we take can have ramifications that can carry on for decades and generations. Amen. Amen. And I'll just suggest, I mentioned September 11th. We just commemorated it here just a few weeks ago. And I pray we never forget it, by the way. I remember exactly where I was when the phone call came in from my wife on the morning of September 11th when the first plane hit the Trade Center. I was walking past your Ryan Helms of all places at a golf course. It was September 11th. We were walking. The phone rang roughly 10 o'clock in the morning. I answered the phone and I could tell from the tone in her voice that life had changed. I didn't know what happened yet, but I could tell by the tone of my wife's voice that something was off. And as soon as she began to speak, the vacuum that was created in my gut was palpable. I knew we were one of life's defining moments. And what began to happen is you began to see after September 11th a cry for revival and a cry for, for prayer, right? We saw our political leaders coming together hand in hand, arm in arm, across the, the House of Congress and the White House and these various places, putting on a show of uniformity, compelling Americans everywhere to pray for this nation. I had a dear friend of mine who's now with the Lord. As someone said to him, America is still standing. He said, my friend, the problem is not that America is still standing. The problem is that America is not kneeling. Mm -hmm. Amen. You see, in those life-defining moments, if we're not careful, we can catch ourselves making choices and, making, and taking actions without giving good forethought and wisdom and prayer and wisdom and spiritual leadership. And again, the consequences of those choices in those moments, our children and our grandchildren. Amen. Amen. I'm going to 
to suggest to you that as a culture in the United States of America, that we are all we are right now at one of those life turning moments. And by that I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen time. Please don't hear me. I don't have a, a heavy spirit about me today. I, I, I so love the music this morning and, and the opportunity to come into God's presence and just worship Him. But I'm going to tell you, I've never seen our land so divided the way that it is today. That's just. That's not a criticism. I don't mean to be negative. That's just an observation. You got the left. You got the right. You got the Republicans. You got the Democrats. You got the gay. You got the straight. I mean, doesn't matter. They divide us on all levels. Amen. <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. Let's just be honest about it. They divide the denomination against the denomination. They divide us from the church. Go out. That's the that's the mission. It's to divide God's people. Amen. And so I would suggest that America is facing today one of life's defining moments and the choices that we make as a culture our children and grandchildren will feel like this. So what can we do? What do we do in times like this? That promise that there is a hope for tomorrow, that giving light, that we can shine, that we can show our children and future generations. What can we do right now in this moment that's going to ensure that that opportunity exists for them the way that it did for you and I. Let me share with you four simple thoughts that I think bring, come to the past force in Isaiah 6. First of all, let me share with you what we must see. What we must see. You see, I had this brief halt back on September 11th, and I don't want to just live there for you know, very long, but I do want to spend a moment there. I had this brief halt back on September 11th that what we were going to see was that our real need was for God again. What I really had high, high hope for was that we would realize that the path that we had chosen was, was what had led us down that, that, that place, that destiny that we were finding ourselves at. And then now this cry to return to God and to prayer and to the house of God was going to be real and it was going to be deep and it was going to be life-changing. That's my prayer. And as I look back, it, it was, if, if I'm being honest, I feel like it, be, it was superficial. It started in, in, in the right efforts, and yet it seemed like it fell short. It seemed like it was short-lived, and now all of a sudden, here we are 20 years later, and we have we forgotten what even happened. Let alone the God that we had recommitted to on that time. But I would suggest to you that in these moments, if there's any hope for our children and our grandchildren, then it begins with this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw who? I saw the Lord. My friend, listen to me. Here's what happened in the nation of Israel. Uzziah was a great king. He had reigned for 52 years. He wasn't perfect. He had been stricken with leprosy because of some things that he had done. But by and large, he had led Israel back to the paths of righteousness and the paths of, of God's blessing and prosperity. And the nation of Israel had rallied back to the things of God under his leadership. There are some historians that would even say that Isaiah and Uzziah had a family connection. That they were distant cousins on some level. My point is simply this. That their hope as a nation for 52 years had rested in the hands of this king called Uzziah. But suddenly Uzziah was gone. Their world was turned upside down. The nation of Israel in the days that followed this, this event were dark days of uncertainty. They didn't know who was going to take over. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what Babylon and Persia and the other empires would do now that Uzziah is out of the way. They're already under the hand of tyranny. They're already facing oppression. And now the one they had put their hope in was gone. My friend, listen to me. One of the challenges and risks we have is that we can tie our hopes in the things of this world. And listen, they're not all bad in and of themselves. You understand that. They're just not eternal. Yes, yes. You get the difference. If we're not careful, we will tie our hopes to that which is temporal. And that which is temporal is being stripped away. And my friend, what's happening to the church and what's happening to the world is God is pulling back the veil of heaven and he's allowing us to look into the throne room of God. And if there's any hope for America, it's that we, too, like when Uzziah died, we will see him Amen. high and lifted up. Amen. See, my friend, they didn't need to see Uzziah. They needed to see King Jesus. Amen. And so I would suggest that it begins with what we must see. And what we must see is him. I think about what 
Moses had said in Exodus chapter 33. Moses is one of those interesting individuals to me. Because again, if you're not careful, it's these events that Moses faced that, will, that, that, that can sour us. I would ask you to consider Moses' life for a moment. I mean, God chose him to lead the children of Israel out. He obeyed. It took a little bit of negotiation with his burning bush and the promise of Aaron and all that, right? But, but ultimately, Moses agreed, and he went into to Egypt. He leads the children of Israel out. And what should have been about a three-week journey to cross into the Jordan or across the Jordan into the Canaan land now takes him 40 years. Not because of Moses' sin. Moses wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of the activities of others around him. Mm -hmm. And yet the flow out, the, 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 the fallout of that day fell to Moses. Moses wandered in the wilderness leading God's people as they wandered in error. And yet, in spite of that, you see Moses in Exodus chapter 18. You find him, he's under Exodus 33. He's on this mountain, he's talking with God, and God says to him, he says, I'll go with you to the promised land, and you can get the heart, a picture of Moses' heart. And he says to the Lord in Exodus 33, 18, he says, he says, Lord, if you're not going to go with us, then don't send us. If you're not going to be there, I don't want to go. And what it tells me about Moses' heart is it didn't matter whether he was in the wilderness or whether he was in the promised land. The only thing that mattered is wherever God was, that's where he wanted to be. And my friend, as a nation, we have set our eyes on the things that look good to you and I, where we ought to be looking at what matters to him. Because when this veil is pulled away, it will not matter what we think. It will not matter what our friends think. It will not matter what the White House thinks or the politicians think. When this veil is pulled back, all that will matter is what he thinks. Amen. 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 And so what we must see is him high and lifted up. Secondly, what we must say. You see, what we must say is this. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, brothers, I want to be honest with you. I hear people talk sometimes about the presence of God. Yeah. In such casual tone. In such casual ways. We don't serve a casual God. Nope. I hear people say, literally, the Lord stood beside me as I shaved in the mirror this morning. My friend, if the Lord stood beside you, you would be prostrate on the ground in the presence of a holy God. Mm -hmm. Don't bring him down to your level. Let him bring you to his. Amen. But we must see him. But when we see him as he is, you will never see yourself the same again. See, Isaiah was a prophet. He was the cousin to the king. He was in a seat of notoriety. Isaiah was held in high regard. I mean, uh, as, as, as much as a prophet can. <laughs> he was in a seat of prominence in a good time, but now it's gone and it's stripped away. But, but all of a sudden, now it's not Uzziah. He's, you see, here's the thing. If I compare myself to Uzziah, I, I, I may not look so bad. Right? Because we're all as human beings, we're all flawed. That's just, that's just. Let, let just, now that we have this Adamic nature, the nature of Adam, that says we were born with a sinful nature. So we all have it. Mm -hmm. But if I'm comparing myself to other fallen humanity, it doesn't look so bad by contrast. So if I'm just looking at King Uzziah, I can feel pretty good about Isaiah. If Joe is just looking at those around him, Joe might feel pretty good about Joe. But when others are stripped away and the facade is gone and it's just me and the Holy of Holies, I wonder how I will feel then. Because in that moment, when I see him, I will not say, wow. When I see him, I will say, whoa. You understand, when we come into the presence of the true and living God, we're not enamored with him enough to say, wow, what a Jesus. We say, whoa, what a holy God we serve. Amen. Glory. Amen. Glory. Isaiah said, woe is me. Why? Because he'd seen God. Compared to Uzziah, he wasn't crying, whoa. But now he'd seen Jesus. And once he'd seen Jesus, he said, woe is me for all I'm not because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people unclean lips. You see, here's what happened, brother. 
John. He saw God, and then he saw himself, and he began to look around, and he couldn't see his fellow man the way he had before either. He could no longer make excuse for what was going on around him. Because God had invited him into the Holy of Holies. You see, my friend, when you step there, your life will never be the same. Amen. Yes. What you must see is him high and lifted up. Amen. And what you must say is, woe is me. Yes. Because I'm not die. I'm not die. <laughs> what you must hear. See, let me set the barrier for you. Now all of a sudden, in this moment of conviction, In this moment of conviction, and I truly believe that in the moment that Isaiah saw go, conviction gripped his heart because he saw himself. Mm -hmm. And all of those closets and dark corners of his heart mm -hmm. were suddenly drug out into the light. Yes. There was nothing concealed in the light. Mm -hmm. It was all open before the Holy God. But then he saw this, Brother John. He saw this symbol. He saw this angel. So I didn't talk a lot about what was going on in this thing. He saw this angel go to this altar. And he takes the tongs and he takes a coal from off the altar. And the coal is symbolic of fire purging or a, a burning away. And he touches it from the lips of Isaiah. And it symbolized the purging of his sins, the washing away of his uncleanness. So now Isaiah. It's in the Holy of Holies. And he's looking at this holy God. And he has seen himself as he is. And he's crying out, woe is me. But God sends an angel and touches his life. And he says, your sins are taken away. Isaiah, I don't see you like that. Lord. Did you hear that? Amen. Isaiah, Thank that's you, not how I see you. Isaiah, that may be what you see in the mirror. But that's not what I see. When I see you, I see my son. He heard the cry for help. 
You see, that's what got Paul to, to, to Philippi. Paul was ministering midway through the book of Acts. And God spoke to him in a vision of the church as a Macedonian call. And you heard a voice of a man saying, come over and help us. Friend, listen to me. There's a world out there right now that's crying, saying, who will help us? Who will help us? I'm about to step on some things that may not get palatable. Yes, no. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm dealing with things every day in the workplace now that I've never had to deal with before. Brother Joe, you and I were talking about this, and this HR politically correct day and time in which we live. It's a different day for the believer. I'm telling you, man, you know, the, the things that, when I think about what Isaiah said in Isaiah 5, when he said, woe to him who calls evil good and good evil, that's the days that we're in. And the, the challenges in the workplace, when it comes to the things of God, you see, they want to shut them down, and they do it with vitriol. Man, you'll be met with anger. That's okay, respond with kindness. If you're going to be met with hatred, that's okay, respond with love. Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you. Is yeah. they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. What are they doing? They're crying for help. We're dealing with this huge issue in my office right now, this LGBTQ transgender issue. I mean, no disrespect. God loves them the way he loves me. Yes. Yes. Did you hear me? Amen. This house should roar with amen. 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 He loves them exactly the way he loves you and I. Amen. God amen. cannot love you any more, and he cannot love you any less. He is love. We're not careful. We will drive a wedge and push away the very ones God has called us to reach. He heard the cry from heaven. He heard the call for help. He heard the cry from heaven. Amen. Listen to me. I'm going to spend a very few moments here because this is not a subject anybody likes to talk about. Especially God. And yet Jesus spoke about hell twice as often as he did heaven. Why? Because he wants to know what you're there. But in this moment, when Isaiah saw what God had done for him, he realized that if God didn't do that for everybody else, he saw the desolation at the end of the chapter. And I think about Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. Brother Joe, this has been something that honestly had bothered me all my life. As a little boy, I can remember my father preaching messages on the rich man and Lazarus. And I can remember as a small child hearing the echoes of the voice of the rich man as he cried out from a godless eternity for God to send Lazarus to just tip his finger in the water and touch it to my tongue. And, and Abraham said, that's not possible. There's a great gulf fixed between us. And then the rich man takes his eyes off himself, which in itself is pretty telling, and he begins to think about his brothers that are still here. And this is the part that I've never been able to get away from. I wish it bothered me more. Did you hear me? I wish it robbed me in my sleep. I wish it broke my heart. But the next thing he said is, then would you send them back to the earth so they can tell my brothers, lest they end up in this place. Isaiah heard that call. And all he could say is, here am I. Send me. Amen. Send somebody. Send anybody. But you've got to send somebody. What we must see is him. What we must say is the Lord is me. What we must hear is his cry. From heaven for help. Sin and who will go for us? God never qualified that. He didn't say who will go to Jerusalem, who will go to Samaria. He just said who will go. Joe wants to ask questions and qualify it before he accepts the challenge. 
Listen to me. God's not interested in revealing His will for our consideration. Just our obedience. Amen. Amen. Did you catch it? He's not interested in revealing His will for you and I to consider whether we like it. He reveals His will so that we can obey Him. My friend, this is me. These are hard times. I love you, church. This is a mountain. You ought to listen. We ought to thank God for what you have. Amen. Amen. But there is a world around you, my friend, that's yes. crying out for help right now. They're hurting. They're not showing up at your church door knocking, saying, Can we come in and hear the hope? They're showing up at your desk in the workplace with vile and vitriol. They're showing up as your neighbor with anger and bitterness. Amen. They're showing up at the voting stations because they don't like how you vote. And Jesus says you love them anyway. He says you love them anyway. I wonder if you just stand with me this morning. If you stand with me, God, I want to ask you to just be My friend, I'm convinced this morning that America is that one of his life's defining moments? Can I just share with you a personal story that took place? Unless there may be someone here who thinks that your loved ones are gone too far. Unless there's someone here who thinks that maybe your spouse is just not reaching. Your world has been turned upside down. Your marriage, your children, that one individual that God's laid on your heart right now, with every head bowed, I want you to consider that person. The one that you know, if they were to leave this world right now, there's great doubt as to whether they would spend eternity with the Lord. And the enemy wants to tell you it doesn't, it doesn't matter for you to tell them, it won't help for you to talk to them because they won't listen anyway. And I'm here to tell you, don't buy the Lord. I'm here to remind you that as God told Ezekiel that he's sending us into a stiff-necked people, but go and tell them anyway. That when they hear, whether they believe or whether they don't, they'll know there's been a people of God amongst them. And my friend, this neighborhood and this community needs to know that there is still a people of God amongst them. I had a personal conversation with a co-worker yesterday, a Friday, who has never professed to be a believer in Christ. <laughs> He and I share birthdays. He asked me what I was doing on my birthday. I said, I'll be preaching a revival in his land. Why don't you come and go with me? He proceeded to tell me that he had recently made a profession of faith. He was planning to get baptized. He started to talk about an associate pastor from a church that he's been attending. <coughs> he started to visit him months ago, once a week, when he was in the hospital for an extended period. Then he had never attended the church. The pastor owed him no debt. But every week, this pastor showed up at Danny's bedside. Danny recovered, <coughs> got home from the hospital, and he could not get that pastor in his blood out of his mind. Danny now told me Friday, <coughs> Pastor Joe, I know exactly who I want to baptize me. That one who loved me when no one was dead. Friend, listen to me today. There's a world that needs the church to be the church. They need us to see Jesus because we will never see ourselves until we see Him. We need to see ourselves so we can see what He's done for us, that it might compel us to love and share with Him. As the musicians play this morning, that one that God has laid on your heart, if you'd like to come and pray, are you willing to come to the throne room of God as Isaiah did? Are you willing to take the Uzziahs out of your life and say, God, I know I've said before there may not be any hope. For my marriage, for my children, for my my job. But whatever the situation is, when you come into God's throne, I promise you, He says, come to me. If you'd like to pray this morning, you're just...